uh, Massa Mike. I put that email address up there. Um, if you copy that down here, uh, it might be possible to hook up with some of you again on one of these cool space adventures. Um, and I, at least you have my address. You can send me an email and tell me why I should take you on the next trip, right? Uh, anyway, um, about 100 years ago, 100 years ago this year, 1911, there was a race to the South Pole, and there were two teams. The guy who won, won because he ate his dogs. He ate the dogs, the dog sled dogs. So if you go to the South Pole now on December 14th, every year they have hot dogs for lunch, celebrate this great event. And the funny thing about it is that uh, after you do that once, you didn't get away with it, but if you had to eat your dogs every time you did something like that, you know, they, you wouldn't be doing it very often, right? Uh, it's sort of un not very cool, I guess. But to, it's, so in order to get it done first, under certain circumstances, you can bend the rules. And my whole life is about doing that, getting things done uh, any way I can do it on a low budget. Sometimes I call this presentation engineering on a shoestring. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, let me just copy this down here. Here you go. Yeah, so sometimes I call this presentation engineering on a shoestring because we don't have a lot of money, but we still do these ridiculous things. And if we had to study it, we'd cost, spend more money studying it and not doing it than we do doing it. So what I like to do is uh, see something that needs to be done, figure out a way to do it inexpensively fast. I do about four projects a year, and uh, i got stories to tell. This is um, 25 years. Actually, now it's 27 years. We've done 110 way cool projects in that that amount of time nobody does that right but that's what we do and we a lot of times i look at the audience i say would you like to go to some place like the north pole everybody wants to go and so i said tell me why i should take you and next thing you know you're on a trip and you find yourself at the north pole it just happens many 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 times so it's not not ridiculous at all uh and uh i'm just going to give you some ideas of some of the way cool things we do there's a whole gamut of them. I can't cover them all. Just I'll, when I run out of time, I'll stop talking about it and talk to you about it after afterwards. Okay. So um, first thing was uh, I wanted to go to the South Pole. So I used to throw a dart at the world map, and wherever it landed, I'm going to go there, right? So if it lands in the Pacific Ocean, I go to Fiji Island or something, right? I went around the world a few times, and then one day I hit the map and it bounced off, hit the floor. So where do I have to go now? Antarctica, right? So nobody I know knew how to even spell Antarctica. I don't know what it is, where is it, where is this place? So what I did was, uh, this was in February of 1983, and so by November 1983, I was standing at the South Pole. How do you do that? It's, it can't be done. So as I, did, I looked through some astronomy magazines, and I find out about people that are working at the South Pole, like this group of guys, and they were building a, uh, a, a container for some scientific instruments so the instruments could survive unattended for nine months to a year in this very harsh environment. And it would collect data on things <coughs> with no people around. And it gets, the temperature gets down below 100, minus 100 centigrade, well, minus 90 centigrade. And then um, I said, well, that looks like a spacecraft to me. Maybe I can help you. So I, I convinced them that I could help them because one of the problems they had was they, they had no communications off the South Pole. Uh, if you go back to this picture here, you see these the geostationary satellites over here cannot see over the horizon. They can see the edge of Antarctica, but they can't see the South Pole or the North Pole. They can only see about 81 degrees, not 90. And so there was no way to get the data off. All the communication satellites were in the wrong orbit. The ones that were polar orbiters, like this kind here, they go over the pole every, every day, 15 times a day, but there were no communication satellites over there. So I said, I, I'm going to fix the problem for you. <laughs> and we did. Went over there, and I, I, uh, I wrote a proposal at the South Pole that we'll use polar orbiting satellites that, um, <coughs> oops, like this polar orbiting satellites that, um, I don't know why it bounces twice, but it does. Okay, look at that, it always bounces. There. Okay, polar orbiting satellites that have a uh, transponder on board that would um, repeat the signal. If you send data to it, it would send the data back to you and you measure the Doppler shift. 
and it would tell you the speed and the uh, the uh, di uh, the direction, range and uh, range rate, the distance away and how fast it was going. And uh, I said, well, why don't we just put data on that on that uplink, and then the satellite will rebroadcast it, and so anybody under the satellite will see it. So we could put a ground station on the edge of Antarctica and one at the South Pole, and we'd track that satellite like this. Every time one of those satellites would come over, 14 times a day, three satellites, you get 40, 42 passes a day, maybe five, 10 minutes each, and um, send data through the ranging channel over the horizon to the edge of the continent and then back home. Wrote the proposal, one year later it was done. <laughs> one year later it was done. <laughs> This is us getting ready to go. <coughs> we found a bunch of, um, I didn't have any money for this project. So I had to convince somebody to give me some equipment and money anyway. And there was a, uh, before GPS, you know GPS? Before GPS, there was something called the Transit Satellite System, which was a, uh, a system of satellites that did what GPS is doing. And you would have a special receiver. And, and if the receiver got the data from the satellite, it could tell you where you were but you have to know where the satellite is. So in order to keep calibrating where the satellites are, they had to collect data from every satellite every day and get the data back to Washington, D.C. by two o'clock in the afternoon every day, that kind of thing. And so they were using ham radio, ham radio, right? 75 bits a second, 75 bits a second, an error every 100 bits on a good day, and blackouts for as long as 26 days. And that's what they were doing. So I said, hey, I'll use this satellite link. And it'd be no errors. Maybe we'll do start out with 10,000 bits a second, maybe 20,000. Could do more, and let's, let's do that. So they said, well, if it works, we'll pay you for it. So I convinced them it could work, and they gave me $200,000. So I bought the equipment. And then I had to get more equipment, so we scrounged up all this used equipment from NASA ground stations that were closing down over the, around the world. And it's, we got all the stuff working. And then we, we did a test here at Goddard. What, right? Right here at Goddard. I don't know why this bounces. Okay, we did this test at Goddard here. You see we had the two satellite dishes here, McMurdo and South Pole, and we sent data between them through a, through a satellite in Maryland, in USA, and proved that it would work. All the VIPs were there. Everybody was watching. And then we took it to Antarctica and set it up there. And, and then we also uh, set one up at the South Pole and at that time, 1984, we didn't have a uh, crane, so we took this forklift and put a pipe on it and turned it into a crane. Still wasn't high enough, so I built this ramp that went way out there, and we drove up the ramp to uh, put the dome over the top. Okay. This thing bounces. It's kind of weird. All right, so now, that was cool space number one. I'm not getting anywhere with this thing. Let me just hit the, just hit it. Uh, okay, so now what happens is you see the little orange dome out here, and that's our team. And we land on the snow, it's two miles deep. The snow is two miles deep. And we land with skis so your feet never touch the ground. You're walking in space, two miles high in space, basically. Uh, here is a picture of the dome. Um, there, there, this one. Okay, that's it. You notice this was the South Pole Station. Inside, there's little buildings in there, and the dome keeps the wind off you. Okay, but, so this was a, a landmark for the South Pole, and here's my antenna over here, right? So, um, a couple years later, my little son came up and said, hey, look at what I found in the comics. He said, there, uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? And here it says, I'm down someplace with this dome and this little orange ball. <laughs> it's in the comics. So if you make the comics like you're really in, you know, that's like the ultimate. You made the comic strips, my God. So here we are, okay, now. <laughs> okay, so, oh, oh, back, back. There, okay, there. Sorry about this, this bounces or something. But anyway, um, this was the first computer hard drive in Antarctica, the whole continent. This is 1984. So we had a eight inch floppy, 256 kilobytes on a floppy. And you had to have two of them to do the job. You had to boot up with one, take it out, put your application software to track the satellites in the second one. So that was the first computers. It was a DEC 1101 
an 1102 hard drive. <laughs> and so now I've got this hard drive for a museum. And now this other thing we did while we're at it, that, that satellite is, uh, as it was launched in 1967, it was in 1967. It was a advanced technology satellite. It was it was going to demonstrate applications of VHF technology in space. The VHF is like the TV is VHF and radio sometimes VHF, taxi cabs VHF, and so they said, what if you you have to have a line of sight with VHF? But what if you could relay it off something up real high? Then it could see farther that way, right? Well, let's put something on a spacecraft way up there and then relay it all around the world. So, so this was demonstrating how you could use a spacecraft VHF relay. And it was a spinner. <coughs> so it, it didn't have any uh, attitude control systems to break down. It just spinning forever. It'll be spinning until the end of the time. <coughs> and then it, uh, it was also out in the sunlight, way out of, above the Earth. So it hardly ever goes behind the Earth and gets a shadow. So the batteries die and it's still working. So now it was launched in 1967, and by the time I saw it in 1984, it was done its job, but it's still working. And so you know how it, these communication satellites orbit around the equator. But if you don't keep them uh, controlled with your own uh, uh, attitude control, with your own uh, propulsion system, if you run out of propulsion fuel, the, the orbit plane will drift. So a, a little bit each year until finally it's high enough up that it can see the South Pole for a few hours here and the North Pole a few hours there. And at that point is when I wanted to use it. So when I went to Antarctica with the other job, I said, hey, we can actually set up another telephone system for you with this guy. It's still working and it's free and nobody's using it. It's just working. So I grabbed that satellite and set up a phone call system and did the first phone calls from the South Pole. And this is the kind of stuff we use, the ham radio stuff. But it was uh, a modem. Put the antenna on the dome. And these are the first computers associated with that. Little Alpha 2E. I mean, uh, Apple 2E. Has anybody ever used an Apple 2E? You ever heard of it? Never heard of that. So before you were even born, right? <laughs> you know Apple 2E? <laughs> he knows. All right. All right, there it is. And then um, put the antenna on the dome. All right. All right, this is the first phone call. That's the first phone call from the South Pole. December uh, 15th, 1984. All right. <coughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's my brother. <coughs> now, uh, this is the first email. You got the floppies here? <coughs> first email from South Pole. All right, go ahead. And this time is the first polar orbiting shuttle. We sent a message. We sent a message here uh, from, he from here to here, up to here to here. Over here, down there, back there. So it was the first polar orbiting space shuttle. And uh, that was our first uh, uh, text message or the picture on it. <laughs> All right. Uh, then uh, this was a decal made up for um, National Science Foundation. These are all the types of things they do all in a day's work because in the South Pole, there's only day or night. It's either day or night, half a year each. And, uh, and so we did all these different things. Now this is one of the things was was all right. I'm just going to put this here. Yeah, I'm just going to forget this. Okay. All right. Next. All right. This is my mailing address. The first time it was used was 1984, December 15th. Oh yeah, I'll just do it here. December 15th, right here. So people have been sending me mail ever since then to this address. All right. Go ahead. They named a glacier after me for doing this, but I think it's melting. <laughs> uh, this is a big balloon. Now these things are launched from. Uh, we got uh, one of the things I wanted to do was uh, launch balloons from Antarctica, and I tried to convince uh, NASA to do it, but they said it was too difficult to work down there. And uh, I told them the reason for doing it is that, well, a balloon sits up in the top of the atmosphere, and at nighttime it gets cold and it starts to sink. And so they have sand on board. They dump the sand, and it stays at altitude. But then the next day, as the sun comes up, it gets heated up, and it rises. So you have to let out gas to keep it at altitude. Then you let out sand. Then you let out gas. Before you know it, the mission's over. So it only lasts a short time. So I said, do it from Antarctica. The day-night cycle means a lot less sand. <coughs> and it'll go around the Earth, come back where you launched it, instead of losing it in the ocean. <coughs> they didn't want to do it, but, we, but there was a gamma ray burst. Uh, 1980, uh, 87, 
where it was only visible from the southern hemisphere and I was able to get the U.S. Air Force who was interested in, in detecting nuclear explosions around the world. They wanted to get a gamma ray detector that the scientists were making for other reasons. They wanted to use it for detecting nuclear blasts. So we got them to pay for it. We took the instrument down with the Air Force and launched the balloon right here. Okay, and uh, this is McMurdo when we launched it right on this ice shelf here. All right, go ahead. And this is what it looked like. It was a, it was a balloon payload. This whole thing is like a satellite. It, it, it hooked on the balloon and it rises up, okay? And so here it is. And then the balloon, the balloon is laid out on the ground. And when it, as the balloon rises, you know, it picks up the payload right here. And so um, that balloon starts out about as big as a house, but when it gets up to uh, uh, 120,000 feet, it's as big as this entire building, bigger than this building, the whole building, the entire building would fit inside the balloon. It's like a soccer stadium. It's unbelievable how, much, how big they get. And then they sit like a bubble on the upper atmosphere and they float around the world at 150 miles an hour. And then they come back to the same place you cut down the parachute and you, there's a parachute right in here. <coughs> I think right there, you cut this off, and then the parachute opens up, and the, the payload returns to Earth. <laughs> so I got them to launch balloons, and now they're doing it every year. <laughs> this is uh, one of NASA's interesting satellites called a tracking data relay satellite, and it has these big dishes. They're about uh, five meters across. And they'll point at, they're out here at geosynchronous altitude, like 20, 23,000 uh, miles out. But they look down at the Earth, and they, uh, they'll track all these low Earth orbiting satellites, and they'll, they'll pick up the data from the satellite here and dump it over there, because the satellite can't see it, but the satellite can see it out here. And so we relay the data to where it has to go. At 300 million bits a second in 1983, that's what that was doing in 1983, is so far ahead. Everybody else is using 14.2 modems. If they had a modem, it was like ridiculous. And this is 300 million bits a second. It's like, so what are you gonna do with all that horsepower? Who the hell is gonna use that? Okay, so uh, I said, I'll do it, I got an idea. We can use it to unload Antarctica. We can collect a lot of data from Antarctica where the satellites come over every orbit and then dump it back home with this guy. So we went down and did a test here, demonstrated with a little antenna, we could actually do that, all right? And uh, of course, the satellites are so low on the horizon here that it's like looking straight out here because you're down at 78 degrees south latitude and it, the satellite can only see to 81. So unless you're right on the longitude line, you hardly see it at all. It's like, you know, so it's right on the edge. And if there's any mountain in the way, then it's hard to see it. So we had to prove that we could see it on the side of this mountain. All right. And go ahead, we built this ground station to it. And then one day they started letting the satellites drift. And so we said, hey, we can now see it from uh, closer in. We didn't have, the mountain was on this island and we had to get back 24 miles to another island to, to see over it. Because you know, if you're right up against the mountain, you can't see it. But if you get back to here, then you can see over it, you know? So I said, hey, the, the satellites are gonna be allowed to drift like that ATS thing did. And what's happening is they'll start to show up over the mountain here a few hours a day. And so we could probably put a ground station conveniently on the other, on the other island where everything else is and run fiber over to it instead of a microwave link. And so, but the question is, how do you know if you can see the satellites through the, through the mountains? And so uh, there's no maps or anything like that. And they said, it'll take a long time to study it. Probably can't be done. No, no, I got an idea. Another idea. Here's this idea. You, we're going to take this little, this little transmitter. Go ahead. This guy here. It's a it's a one watt transmitter and a little three inch antenna. And we're going to put this in our in our, our our little track vehicle and drive it along like this, broadcasting out there. And if the satellite's pointing at us and it hears us, then we know it got through the mountains. So what will happen is the guy back in in uh, New Mexico will will call McMurdo Antarctica and say, "We got it." We don't have it. Turn left. Okay, now right there. Mark that. And we mark it. See? And we drive along. How about here? No, nope. Over here. Yep. Yeah, mark that. And so in one afternoon, we did a whole job for nothing. Didn't cost anything. Could have been expensive. All right. Here we are taking it out there. We got a little little neck 486 laptop. All right. <laughs> here we are. Hey, we say it's right there. 
we did it on a helicopter too. Just see how high we had to get to see over the top. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, this radome was in Antarctica, but unused. It had been there for about 10, 15 years as a, um, a landing radar for aircraft to land on the ice, and it was empty. So we, we got that and moved it 600 feet to where we could see the satellites here, and uh, it all was done. It hardly only cost the effort to move that thing. All right. Uh, we also did satellites for weather and ozone. Go ahead. This is, uh, this is uh, NASA decals all this, all this time. And this kind of equipment we've had in here, but every year we try to upgrade it. All right. And this was a opportunity to look at the ozone hole. We were launching a satellite that um, would look at the ozone every day and, um, and, and watch the ozone hole develop each year to see how things were changing. And this, at this point, they had recognized that people had caused the ozone hole and they were trying to stop making chlorofluorocarbons. So we wanted to see what the impact would be. And the satellite was, was looking at the ozone every day over the entire Earth. So whenever it came over Antarctica, it would come over Antarctica every orbit. All right, go ahead. And we'd make a picture like this. Every swath, every, as it would be a swath here, and the next orbit would be a swath here, the next orbit. And you get the entire thing mapped out every day. And what we did was I got NSF to pay for my stuff by saying, uh, we'll give you the satellite view in real time so you can launch your scientific balloons into the ozone hole. Okay, so they gave me $30,000 to to bring the equipment and people down there to write the software and to collect the data. And then they used it to uh, uh, for their balloon launches in the ozone hole in Antarctica. So it was like a collaboration between NASA and the National Science Foundation. So rather than having all the money, I just let that uh, worked a deal. <laughs> All right. And then, uh, okay, then we converted that to a launch support system. You see, when we launch satellites out of uh, California in a polar orbit, they go south, and the first land they see is Antarctica. And so, so what happens is um, if you have to blow up the, the rocket, it doesn't land on anybody's head. So we launch them from the west coast of the USA south over the ocean, and the first land that sees it is Antarctica, and that was where I had my ground station. So we started supporting launches. And this gave me opportunities to take people like you guys to Antarctica every year. I was taking somebody down there every year, like, okay, you did a great job over here. We'll take you to Antarctica and we'll upgrade this system again, you know? So this last year, I took a guy that was working with me for the summer, two summers in a row, it was pretty good. And he, he was down in Antarctica for three weeks uh, working on some of this stuff uh, 25 years later, you know, that kind of thing. All right. Uh, we took the, the administrator of, of NASA, the number one guy in NASA has a private jet. So we took his private jet to Thule, Greenland. Where, where the hell is Thule, Greenland? Thule, Greenland is like, it's Thule, Greenland, uh, if you go backwards, right there, this is, this is Greenland. And Thule, Greenland is way up here, way up there. It's 76 and a half north latitude. There's nothing up there. But what we have up there is NORAD. It's like there's a little line of, uh, of, um, of radars. All across, uh, all across here like this, all across uh, Greenland and Canada and Alaska, listening for ICBMs from Russia to come over the top, you know? And so we track every nut and bolt or anything that's floating around up there, track everything. And if something isn't where it's supposed to be, then red lights go on, the red phones start ringing, and you know, that kind of thing. But, but we went up there and uh, we're gonna show those guys how to use our, our satellite uh, software to get weather data there. All right, all right, and now, and go ahead. This, all these different people got a chance to go up there and do this ozone thing, and we made the same kind of maps up there. All right, all right, now, um, I'm jumping through these quickly. This, this is another crazy thing happened. Uh, there was a, a weather satellite that uh, was launched, and um, three orbits after it launched, it died. And they, they looked at the data they had been getting and said, what happened? They went back and researched the data and they said, it looks like uh, there was a short on one of the battery chargers. And there's three battery chargers, but number two, through thermal expansion, a, a little bolt had gone, had touched the chassis, zapped everything really quickly, brought the whole bus down, everything went dead. And, uh, and then the satellite was dead, they couldn't send a command or anything. And uh, after a few orbits, it started tumbling. And then the solar array was no longer pointed at the sun, so it was totally dead. <coughs> so even if um, 
the thermal expansions that started the problem had rectified the problem, there would be no power because it can't point to the sun. So for a couple of years, everybody in the world was trying to turn this thing on. And then I, I heard about it on the way to Antarctica, Sunday night, one night, uh, December 4th, I was talking to some people in the control center about this other job I was doing. And they said, yeah, oh, you're doing a VHF job. We still have VHF commands. Too bad you couldn't send commands to our satellite. And I said, well, why don't we try it? They said, well, it would take millions of dollars to study it and years. And uh, we don't know if you could turn this thing on or not. And I said, well, look, give me a letter asking me to do it and $1,500. And I'll take somebody down here that I, I know knows about this thing. And I'll bring them down and try it for free uh, this, this month, at the end of the month. They said, okay, so he gave me a letter, and the letter was to allow me to uh, take a ham radio operator guy down there. Uh, now, um, this was a satellite that was tumbling out of control. You can see how you have to point that solar array at the sun very carefully as it goes around. You have to keep it pointed at the sun. All right, and that's what it looked like before we launched it. But the reason I was going down to Antarctica was because of this other guy. This was a satellite that had been... Uh, launched in 73, still working. It was halfway to the moon orbiting the Earth. It took 12 days to orbit the Earth one time. And so we were trying to collect data from that because it was only visible for a long period of time in the southern hemisphere, and the farther south, the better. So I had a proposal to collect data from it in Antarctica. So it was going to take a bunch of people down there to do that. And uh, in order to do that, we had to go back, uh, go back, go back, uh, go back. Uh, there, there. Uh, in order to do that, we had to build an antenna. Can you imagine? This antenna is like 14 meters long, and uh, it's got eight 10-meter Yagi antennas right here. These are Each of these are 10 meters long, and that's like 14 meters across. This is, uh, this is 20 meters high. And uh, it, it had a lot of high, a very high gain. It was built by amateur radio guys because NASA didn't do much VHF stuff anymore. This is an old satellite. So we got a bunch of ham radio guys to do it. But they, I wanted the guy that, that designed it to come down there and put it together. He didn't want to go to Antarctica. However, his, since he was an amateur radio guy, he said, look, I'll go for nothing if I can do the first moon bounce from Antarctica. <laughs> first moon bounce. You know how the two-meter hams, they send two-meter signal, bounces off the moon, goes to Japan, or Korea, or China, or any place, and then they get the, they get this credit for the first moon bounce. And uh, at first, the uh, the National Science Foundation said, "No, we don't have any stunts." But now I got this letter from NASA says I got to go down and try to turn on a satellite. So they said, "Okay, you can go." So the letter helped me bring the guy down there to put this antenna together, right? And now we built this in this big contraption here. This is quite an operation, I have to tell you. And then it actually actually was uh, able to listen to the other satellites that were, that were tumbling out of control. And with the, uh, the two-meter system that he was bouncing off the moon, we were able to send commands to that dead satellite. Now, now what happened is the dead satellite is tumbling, but over Antarctica in January, Antarctica is white, right? It's very, very white. So the astronauts coming back from the moon would say Antarctica looks like a torch lighting up the entire infinite blackness of space in a January, right? So here, here is a satellite orbiting uh, the Earth very low, and it comes right through all that backscattered light. And it doesn't make any difference how the solar ray is tumbling, right? It's lit up enough to turn on a minimal amount of loads. And this particular satellite, uh, when it died, it shut off everything, and the only thing that would come on is stuff that was hardwired to the bus. So once you get sunlight into the solar ray, it would pop on again. And if you could send commands Right at that time, right over Antarctica, from that moment, at that moment, you could send a command, turn on the transmitter or something. And so that's what we did, and the thing turned on. <laughs> it's like, whoa. And then now what happened was they said, wait a minute, do you know there's this ragtag team of pirates down, at the, down on the ice planet? They're sending commands to our spacecraft, and they might not turn on a dead one, but they might turn off a good one. We better give them some procedures. <coughs> so, hell, that took us... It took, took them two weeks to come up with a procedure. We just turned the thing on. We just did it. There it is. What do you want to do? Tell me what you want to do. Oh, my God, we got to study this. we got to think about this. Oh, my God. So anyway, it takes some of each. Sometimes you got to be formal. Sometimes you just got to do it. But now they know it can be done. The next year they came back with some plans on how to fix it. it took another year to come back next year. All right, this guy did the moon bounce. So he was on the cover of some amateur radio. He was happy. 
and now he's a superstar. Then we took the thing to um, Canberra, Australia, a few years later when the, when the orbit had changed enough that you could see it from Australia. Then we put the same thing up here on a smaller antenna here. And this is a um, this is a 210. This is a 70 meter dish, 70 meters huge, and uh, it's for listening to uh, deep space, like things that are out there, Pluto and all that. All right. Uh, this is a trip across Antarctica to the South Pole. You see, uh, in Antarctica, there are mountains about the size of the Andes. It continues on down through South America into Antarctica, but the snow accumulation is such that uh, the, only the peaks of the mountains show up at the edge of the continent. If you move towards the center of the continent, the snow goes from a mile and a half deep where the mountains are to three miles deep, three miles deep. And the South Pole is here at two miles deep, but the, the summit is over the center of the landmass. So flying towards the South Pole is really an awesome experience. There's all that white and mountains, suddenly the mountains disappear under the snow, and then there's nothing at all for, for another, uh, flying for another 500 miles. And then you see, um, next one, then you see this little uh, South Pole station with people in it. And this is my antenna right there. I also have antennas over here. All right. Uh, now, one of the things we try to do for the South Pole is put up other antenna, other satellite links. For when uh, old satellites would 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 leave their equatorial plane and start drifting, it was it was no longer useful because if everybody that was using these commercial satellites had to track them, it'd be a lot harder to do that. So they keep them stationary like this, see? and then you don't have to track them from home. But once they start drifting, then then you have to do this. You have to track it like that, right? Because it looks like this, like that. See, so you would be, see, I mean, you'd be, you'd be uh, tracking the satellite, and that, and that was too much trouble. So they bag that satellite, get a new one. But that's when I jump in. So I'll take it. I'll take that old satellite right now, and whenever it comes up over the horizon at the South Pole, we'll put another antenna up there, and we'll send data back through that. So we did it here, and we did it here. Okay. Now we have enough satellite links that every so often during the day we get one of the other satellite links is working. And guess what happened? The comet Shoemaker-Levy. Remember? Don't you remember back in 1994? How many people were alive in 94? I guess all you guys. But there was this comet Shoemaker-Levy that had a bunch of impacts on Jupiter. Guess what? The, the, the uh, observatory at the South Pole could see everything without interruption. The entire event lasting a month, whatever it lasted. And they saw everything. But they couldn't get all the data back. All they had was the links we put in there, and they, they, they got what they could back with that. <coughs> but uh, that was, they stored the data and finally carried it home in the, the three months they have to actually fly in there. All right, now, so I took this VIP group of people from NASA to the South Pole and showed them all the cool stuff we were trying to do and hit them up when we got back for $350,000 to go build a Teeter's ground station at the South Pole where that tracking antenna could point at the South Pole. And then I gave them the 300 million bits a second, boom, just like that. And so that's what happened there. They put that link up. Go ahead. And that, uh, this, is, this is some of the antennas. And we'll go ahead, another one. <laughs> I was taking the VIPs around, all around to see what we we're doing. And uh, then I had them at the edge of the continent and talked about what's going on there. And this is, the, this is what the ice looks like. It's pretty awesome, and from a helicopter, you see the ice pouring down off the uh, continent like that. And, and uh, the ice, when it enters the water, is about 800 feet thick. So it goes into the water and hits the ground there, and the only thing sticking up is uh, one or 200 feet right here. But this goes way down to here. And then it pushes on out, like over here, until it gets to the continental shelf. And then that 800 foot thick ice block starts floating out like this, it does this, and then chunks the size of uh, uh, Connecticut, I guess. Uh, I'm not what's your, maybe, maybe, I don't know, half a Paraguay or something? What is it? State of Rio, chunks the size of the state of Rio break off every year and float away. Anyway, it's pretty awesome to see it. Okay, so go ahead. And so then when I hit those guys up to give me some money, and, we, and the next year, in January, the year after they, they, the VIPs came down, we put up this um, Tedris link, and it could do, it, it, we just put a small link up, do 50 million bits a second. It, would, it could have been 300 million if we wanted to, but nobody needed the data yet, so we did that. And uh, okay, and the next year, 
this doctor that wintered over to South Pole had this emergency and needed an operation on herself. She was the doctor, but you may have heard about it at the South Pole. There was this emergency, and they needed to find somebody that could do the operation. And the one they got was the welder. The guy that does the welding had the steadiest hands. So he could do all the knife cutting, right? He's going to cut this woman's. And the thing is, how are we going to tell him what to do? So we airdropped some uh, equipment down to the South Pole. In the middle of the winter, you couldn't land there because, you know, it's dark and uh, you couldn't take off again. It's very cold and uh, you can't see the ground even. You have to light fires to see it. And then what happened is we airdropped in all this uh, video equipment, hooked it up to that high-speed link, and now you could have uh, teleconferencing all of a sudden. And so doctors back in this USA could guide the, uh, the welder on the knife-cutting job, and, uh, and it became big news. And then she survived. She now she's she just died recently, but she survived all that in 1999. Okay, now now I'll take you on another end of the earth. <laughs> I do this all over the world, so I don't know how many times how many things I can tell you about it quickly. But here we are going to the other end of the earth, up through Canada. You recognize the uh, Alaska, and uh, and U.S. is down here. This is Canada, and and uh, Greenland is over here. This is Thule Greenland, 76 and a half. This is uh, the Arctic Circle is down here, around 67. This is, a, this is a, one of the base stations uh, at 75. And this is, uh, this is uh, Eureka at 80. And the northernmost permanently manned outpost is right up here. It's called Alert. It's 82 and a half north. And then other than that, there's nothing but water. So the North Polar region is water surrounded by land. And the South Polar region is land surrounded by water. So how thick is the ice in the Arctic Ocean? It's about three meters thick. How thick is it at the South Pole? 3,000 meters, a thousand times thicker. And that's because you can get more extreme temperatures over land than you can over water, because water does what? Water circulates, right? It circulates like in your radiator. It keeps everything cool. So you can only get three meters thick ice, and then sometimes it overlaps like that. Okay, you get six meters. This is uh, going through the Canadian Arctic. And we saw I put up another team to work with the National Ice Center and NASA and NOAA and the Defense Agency. And uh, we went and made our own T-shirts, put together a team of people that went up and did something that can't be done. We were going to demonstrate how to bring communications to the most remote locations in the world using that satellite with the steerable antenna. <coughs> so, oh, okay, so right here, here, here we have our little portable communication system, three-inch antenna, one watt. We're driving down the road at 75 north, and we did that same thing we did before. We're pointing it out there, and the satellite is out there pointing at us, you know, with this, and it, we're dumping uh, digital camera data onto the Internet through this satellite while we're moving at 40 miles an hour. And, we're, and then in the back, it's all being powered by a solar array panel. So we gave this to the dog sled team that we're going to rendezvous with, so they could send their data back home, okay? All right, and then here, every, every day for 10 days, we would give a broadcast from some other godforsaken place through the Canadian Arctic, you know? All right, that was a frozen lake over there. And then this is one of our students. Like, this would be an 18-year-old kid, and I brought him along because he's a smart guy, and he was really, really a good IT guy. And he did all the um, uh, communications with other kids who would call in on the Iridium satellite phone. And they would they would um, they would page us, and then we'd call them back. So we'd pay the bill, and then he would he would collect. Uh, we'd do email and things like that, and he would be our, our link to all the students out there that were following this operation. All right, and so then we found an Eskimo village somewhere up there at 75 North, and we put this antenna in the window, and these guys had never seen a computer, didn't know what that was, and we said, "There's a satellite way out there, and uh, what is a satellite?" No. It's, we're gonna we're gonna talk to people back at Washington D.C. Where is that? I didn't know anything about it. So okay, so we set the link up here, and now go ahead. Now we have a we have the K through 12. This is the high school bunch from there, and we have our couple scientists over here. So we're doing a kind of like a a classroom, and then back in Philadelphia, Philadelphia, we've got a bunch of kids, middle school kids from all over the area went to this one school. They got it up on a big screen, and they got us to talking to us in Philadelphia is asking those guys, what do you do in the winter? How do you, what do you do up there for fun? 
Oh, we do snowboarding, you know. What's it? That's pretty cool. All right. All right. So uh, then we wanted to rendezvous with these dog sled team. This is the pole, 90 North. And these guys are working their way up there. And we were down, we were down here with the Eskimo village here. And so we were going to go to this point and then fly to here and back. Now, the way we were going to do that was with these little twin otters. A twin otter is a tiny aircraft uh, like that. And uh, it, could, it could carry um, a few people and maybe uh, 1,600 pounds total of people and cargo. And it would land right on the ice, but it has to be, can't be too bumpy. It flip right over. So it's got to be kind of smooth. And so <coughs> it has a range of about 50% um, more than you need to get there one way, but not enough to get back. So you've got to come up with a gas station en route, right? <laughs> so you need a gas station on a floating sheet of ice at about 86 and a half north. All right, so what do you do is you look at this, say, okay, all right, we're going we're gonna to try to make it to the pole. We're over here. Oh, we're going to map this out. So I give them some satellite imagery data of the ice, and they figure out where the best landing spots would be. And they say, okay, we're going to try to make it to this point. And what they do is they'll take two planes out there, one of them with fuel and one with people. Okay? And then when, one of, when, the, when they land on that ice, they, they refuel the one plane from the other, okay? And, and then uh, the tanker plane comes back, and the other plane flies to the pole, dumps us off, and then comes back and refuels again, and then it gets home. And then it has to come back, pick us up later, a week or so later. Okay, so here we are taking advantage of being on the middle of that ice field, and we're collecting data for scientists on how thick the ice is, because the Arctic sea ice is an indication of global warming. It's very thin, but even if it's getting thinner, you can't tell from space. All you can tell is everything's white. You can tell how rough it is. You can tell how white it is, how bright and white, how far above the, the water line. But you can't tell how much ice is below the water, so you have to drill some holes. All right. And there, that, there's an example of, um, of at the north. And this is not at the exact North Pole, but it's close as we could get. And, uh, you know, and you can see that if you try to go, maybe the North Pole might be just water at that day, on that particular day. So you, you have to uh, land wherever you can land and then dog sled around to get to the pole. All right. So here we are dog sledding around the rest of the way. <coughs> That's us right there. We went around the whole world, dog sled. We met some Argentinian uh, rescue guys from the mountains, mountaineers for the rescue squad in Argentina at the north, that, right up there, going around the North Pole. Like within a, within a mile or two of the North Pole, there were some Russians, there were some Italians, there were some Argentinians guys, and there was us. They're all just, I don't know what the hell they do up there. They're up there training for uh, rescue missions or something. It's like, it's cool. All right, oh, then we had to do, oh, now you bring your laptop to the North Pole, and suddenly you got a NASA satellite that's worth a billion dollars pointing right at you. Well, hell, you can make history on 15 different ways. So first thing we did was we called the South Pole from the North Pole. Of course, that goes right into Guinness records because nobody had ever done that before. And then we did the first live emails, and then we did internet, and we did a live webcast. And it's like everything we did was historic, so we got about five historic milestones just being there with a laptop and a satellite that gave us this awesome horsepower. Boom, you're done. And then come on home again. So compare that to those poor guys that are eating their dogs. This is, this, is free, this is pretty much a free ride compared to that, you know? It's, but, but it's cool. It is totally way cool. I mean. You, you, can, you can dig it. I mean, you can jump on that. Road and then uh, one thing nice about it is you look around behind you and everybody's working harder than you are, so you pick up the pace. And, and it's really great to take a group of people that are, that are excited and hardworking and competent. And, uh, you know, they can stay up all night, eat candy bars, and, uh, and survive. And uh, it's experience of a lifetime just doing this kind of stuff. All right. Oh, here we are. We had the first live classroom. We brought a teacher up there. We did, did this four times. This one here... We brought a teacher up there, did a live uh, a classroom from the North Pole. This is right at the North Pole. There's the antenna pointing right along the horizon to our satellite. We videoed it here, and we had to have a heater, heat, heating pad over the camera to keep it warm. All right. <coughs> now, now, so I was down at um, Antarctica in January, late January of 2003, had a group like you guys, and I said, I was at the North Pole. How many people at the Antarctica would like to go to the North Pole? So how many of you guys would want to go to the North Pole? Anybody? Reggie, you really? You sure you, you know, you, you know how you poop in the snow? Fast. <laughs> right? Okay. All right. But you, how many people go? Raise your hand. 
They said, okay, good. So I had, I had these people in Antarctica. Everybody down there was crazy. So they all wanted to go to the North Pole. I want to go no matter what. I'm going. Let me. So I said, send me an email. Tell me why I should take you to the North Pole. Okay. And then I went back and invented another trip. And 90 days later, we were all at the North Pole. I had 25 people at the North Pole. <laughs> it was all totally justified by science, and somebody else paid the bill. It was unbelievable. Cool. Oh, well, here. <laughs> Here's what happens. You got a team of college students and professors. And what happens is you uh, <laughs> remember I was telling you about the ice. Um, the Arctic ice is an indicator of global warming, right? And the only problem is you can't relate the thickness. Uh, you don't know the thickness that you drill a hole. But what if you could relate the, uh, the thickness to the properties on the surface that a satellite could measure every day? So the satellite measures the whole Arctic Ocean every day. And if you could relate that to the thickness of the ice, then, uh, then you'd have the satellite could map out the thickness and watch it change. <coughs> so I said, hey, I, that was my idea. Let's go do that. We'll get you guys. This guys can live off candy bars and follow procedures, operate the tools you use. But the nice thing about it is we take all of us, everybody in this room here together, all 25 of us, and we will go and do this job in 25 hours where it would have taken four people a month. You don't have a month because the ice is too soft to land on after just a couple weeks. So you've got to go up there and really fast. You've got to land on the ice. If you had to take a boat, it would take a month to get up there. But if you land on the ice, you can do it. I left Baltimore uh, Saturday at 9 o'clock. I was at the North Pole on uh, Tuesday. And then I uh, did everything till Wednesday. And we came back to, to uh, Svalbard on Thursday. I was home within a week. But anyway, oh, we went uh, really, really in class. This time we went uh, with, with the Russians instead of the Canadians. So we did it in style. Now, the Russians, for many decades, they have been camping out on floating ice, eating uh, bear fat and drinking vodka to wash it down. That's what, that's what they do. These guys, I don't believe these guys. You, you think there's, these guys are tough dudes. They just sit out there, bare fat and vodka. And they listen for submarines from somebody. <laughs> and so after the Cold War, there's nobody, they give a damn about submarines anymore. So they got all this machinery. They want to know, what am I going to do with this machinery? Why don't we try to sell tickets? You know, Get, let's become capitalists. So I said, hey, 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 I can help you with that. I would like to take this group of people that I had in Antarctica here, and I want to go to the North Pole. And it turns out that I had a bunch of Native Americans that uh, in the uh, Upper Peninsula, Michigan, which is really boondock, USA, and I said they had a grant from uh, the Department of Defense to bring technology to the reservation. And so I said, you can you pay the bill to the Russians, and I won't have to do any financial dealings with the Russians. That would be difficult. But you pay the Russians, and we'll get, you will be the leaders <coughs> of this expedition. <laughs> And all these other schools, like big name schools like Yale and Harvard, whatever, they'll they'll meet us in uh, Norway, way up above Norway, in an island up there at 78 North. And uh, you'll be the leader of the expedition, and they'll they'll do they'll be working for you, and I'll be your consultant. And so I worked this deal out. The Russians liked it because they hadn't done it before, and they, this is going to break the ice, so to speak, and allow them to uh, start selling tickets. So, for. Um, $60,000, it took 25 people to the North Pole. And everybody got a set of Arctic uh, emergency cold weather gear in the process. Now, when you land, oh, uh, you notice back in the last slide, we landed on a, in a jet. <laughs> That's, that ice is about uh, six meters thick, overlapping like that. And what they do is the Russians would take two helicopters, like the next picture, <coughs> two of these uh, MI-8 helicopters, which uh, <coughs> they... They ping pong from uh, the islands in the uh, uh, Sub Siberian Arctic, Archangel, and they, they, they float around and they land whenever, they only fly off the ground as high as that pole there. That's all they do. They fly right off there, and if they had any trouble, they could just land on the spot. So they, um, they'll land every so often, every 200 miles, and refuel from the tanks on one to the other, and they finally get up to, the, to a place where they're inside the 89 North Latitude Line, right? All right, now they're inside the 89 North Latitude Line, and they look for an over uh, uh, ice flows that have overlapped each other. And then they, they, they sit down there and they offload a little garden tractor with a plow on the front, a little one like you cut your lawn with. And they plow out this two mile runway, you know, up and then finally get it down. And then they got their, their Iridium satellite phone, they got GPS, and they call back to, um, to uh, Svalbard and they say, send up the jet. Here we are, this is our location. Even though the ice is moving, 
they can tell right where to land. They know they got fuel when they land there. They can land with their tires. So now when you get there, then you take the helicopter to the pole. And what we did was we spread out and we had all kinds of guys like you had a plan. This team's going to head that way. This team's going out that way. You guys go over here. You're going to go over here. We're all converged back here for a webcast at, at 1 o'clock. And then uh, we'll go back out and finish the job all night, work all night long, 25 hours. Then we leave and out of here. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Well, I had to get a couple big guys because these are the guys from Antarctica. Had to be at least six foot six in order to reach the drill. <coughs> in order to, we may measure all the surface properties this way the scientists do it. And then we had to drill a hole every so often to uh, tell how deep the ice really was with those surface properties. And then, then you could relate the surface properties to the density. You know, like, like in Antarctica, if the ice is 800 feet thick and it's floating in the ocean, it doesn't make any difference if there's snow on the top or not. But when it's only three meters thick, if it snows on the top and then it melts and it refreezes and it snows and melts and freezes, it changes the density on the above the water line compared to the below the water line. And so we're trying to relate the albedo and the roughness and those things, temperatures and all, to that density change and then give that data to the uh, scientists so they can uh, better estimate the thickness below the water line. And anyway, if that doesn't make sense, I'll explain it later. All right. And so we did a live webcast right here. All right. And everybody got a set of Arctic gear. This lady here was the dean of engineering for Michigan State University. And the year before, her senator had had a deal with uh, called Women Quest, which was um, ordinary women doing extraordinary things. And her, her state senator was uh, had uh, some women from Michigan leading the expedition. And he wanted NASA to try to do something to help her. So I got the job of, uh, I said, I'll, I'll set you up with a live webcast from the US Capitol. You can talk to these ladies at the North Pole and watch it on the internet live. This was 19, uh, this is 2001, and it was called Women Quest. <laughs> and so the next year, they sent the Dean of Engineering up there uh, with me, and then she wanted to start some kind of a engineering program which developed into my robotics boot camp. So that's how that all started. One thing after another, after another. All right, go ahead there. All right, next. All right, now, so that's what started this robotics thing because uh, she wanted us to have industry give projects to their senior design group. And they had to have a senior design project where they had teams of four or five or six people on a team working on something for industry, like, like NASA would do this or the, the uh, automotive guys would, would give them a project. Everybody gave them a project and they'd get credit, like five credits each towards their degree for working on this project. And so I helped her start that with robotics. And so we go ahead, we did another thing. Here we are, just getting that all going. Go ahead. And then uh, one of the things we did to add a little color to it was we built a robotic arm, and we took it to Antarctica, and we, uh, we did a docking maneuver like we were going to do with that arm on Hubble. So we were, we were working with the Hubble people where they had to have a robotic arm to do a docking maneuver, and they were using a um, capaciflector technology for close-in collision avoidance, some weird thing that was using the effect of capacitors close in to keep you oriented as you dock. And we were, we were trying to do the same thing with a robotic arm. And uh, so we, what we did was we did the docking maneuver in Antarctica and operated by remote control from Michigan. So it just made it more interesting. All right. And then uh, these guys got an award for doing that. Go ahead. All this class. And then uh, we started more projects and more projects. And it hit bigger and bigger teams of people. Now I've had 450 interns since 1994. And we were building this robot. Here we, here's where we got into uh, lasers. We were, we were working with the DARPA Grand Challenge. Who knows what that is? DARPA Grand Challenge, it's the uh, SUVs that drive themselves through obstacle courses and roads and things. And they, a lot of times they use this kind of laser, which is more like a, uh, a laser beam that um, if, it, if you break the beam, the alarm goes off. It, and then they point the beam at the curb, and as soon as you lose it, you know you're, the curb is not where it's supposed to be. And you point another beam over here and another beam out there, and you put all the data together to try to stay on track. And that, they, they use a lot of these things. And, and uh, we start, we, what we tried to do was to use them to paint pictures. Go ahead. So uh, uh, there, there's the car here. It has one of these things here, and it's using it to drive itself. But it's only using it as a, um, a kind of a detector. 
where uh, it's it's a range detector, okay? Not not an imager. All right, go ahead. We used it for imaging. <laughs> the other thing we had here was um, Astrobot, and this girl is one of the Astrobotters. This thing is a courier robot. This is, goes inside the shell, and it drives around the hall, tries to map out like a five-year-old, and then find its way back to the point of origin using uh, stereo vision. <laughs> it's still it's an ongoing project. All right. And this was a team we had in 2009. All right, all right, go ahead. And then that, that year, we took uh, we took this this robot to um, Antarctica, operated by remote control from the states, and then we took it up to Alaska. All right. Uh, we had this uh, space cube processor on board, and the idea was for the robot to use the, this flight equipment to operate the robot. It was like a flight computer and it was going to fly on a satellite mission for Hubble, but we actually tested it in the field at 40 below zero and had it run the robot about six months before it flew on the Hubble. All right, and then I was telling you about this yesterday. Uh, when you're on Mars or something, you're, especially if you're on the back side of the planet, you can't see the guys back on Earth. So what you have to do is you have to develop a communication link around Mars with satellites, talk to the satellite, and it relays the data to the robots on the surface when it sees them, right? So it gets it. So as Mars is turning around, you know the orbit is this way, and as Mars is turning around, you only get uh, a contact, one contact in the morning and one at night. If you can figure out how that works, but that, that's how it is. So you get one shot at every day, basically. All right. Now I was showing this yesterday, but this is where we have the mothership and a bunch of worker bots. And I've gotten a bunch of Brazilian guys like you guys involved in this program. So we're, we're going to pick up on this. We, we, follow, we started last year with Janine, and we're going to pick up on it this year and try to get uh, about 10 Brazilians, just like you guys, that really hot to trot, got some, got some talent, and want to write some serious software or whatever. And uh, we're going to build a scan platform for this robot, for this thing here. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, this, uh, this is the kind of laser image that we get. You can tell basically what's going on, right? Okay, go ahead. And then <laughs> this is our little Nanook robot in Antarctica. Here it is again. Looks like Mars, right? So it's really kind of neat to take it down there and simulate Mars. And all the satellite links take just as long as it does to go to Mars. So we can we can uh, develop the. Uh, there's a new protocol for long delays and frequent disruptions called uh, delay tolerant networking, and that protocol was tested here in Antarctica by setting up about 12 nodes all the way from Maryland to Antarctica and we could control each one and turn it off and on as if it was being as if the satellite was passing over the horizon or whatever and then we could demonstrate that the uh, protocol worked or not worked. all right so we did that <laughs> this is uh, Barrow Alaska this is the northernmost tip of the land in Alaska and that's the frozen uh, Arctic Ocean above there so we took it to uh, Alaska and we wrote it out here Next, hey, right after we left Antarctica, <coughs> here it is in uh, Alaska. <coughs> and it took this picture uh, at night. Now it's night all day long in Alaska. It was day all night long in Antarctica. Five days later, we're in Alaska, and we went to night all day long, and um, 40 below zero. So what, what is going on here? Can anybody tell what this picture is showing us? Uh-huh, is that, so what is this, what is this? Uh, all right, and what is it? What is this stuff here? What is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here. Here you go. Give you some of these. D I ran out of NASA stickers, but I got these. All right. Now, uh, did you get one here too? Did you guys? All right. Now, um, so okay. Next, this is. It would take the image and turn it into a top-down view, and then. Uh, then you could stitch the top-down views together. So take a picture here, drive over there, take a picture, and stitch them together until you mapped out the whole area. And then the idea is to plot a path. Oops, um, back. Uh, pl plot a path around the obstacles. Now this is the um, this is the scanner I'm going to give to uh, Janine here. And see, it's got a platform that was working, but I hope you'll improve on it, right? And this picture, you should have this picture when you were to put it together again. So uh, you're going to be hauling this home, I guess, t t tomorrow night. But anyway, uh, it is taking a picture. It's spinning like this. It's um, 
spinning like this, and then the platform will turn around, and you'll end up with a, a two-pi steradian uh, image, like a big beach ball. And it'll tell you distances because of the time of flight of the laser. It gives you range data all throughout that image. Then the next thing is to move over here and take another spherical image and stitch them together, and then unfold it and plot a path around the obstacles, and then send that path uh, uh, commands to a, a worker bot and have it follow the path. <laughs> it's pretty complicated, but I'm sure these people are smart enough they can do it. They made it. They, they did a lot last summer already, so I thought this is really worth investing in. And what I'm trying to do now is get this Brazilian connection going, because um, you know if you're good enough to do this, there's a job for you out there in industry somewhere. You know they need you, right? And I'm thinking that this is a great opportunity to open a lot of doors, uh, and it's fun too. So if nothing else, you'll go to USA and you'll probably get a trip to Alaska because we'll probably send all the team up there. All right, and now we were on the cover of a bunch of magazines with this thing. Um, go ahead. And this is the team of people we had last year, and Janine is right here. Janine is right in the middle, and there is one of the Brazilian guys that worked on that scanner last, last summer. So it's real, you know, it's very real, and you can do it too. It's what, it's the coolest thing about it is, with cool space, uh, anybody can do it if they just jump in there and do it. You know, it's not gonna be a lot of paperwork and crap that keeps you from happening. This is, uh, if you get in there and uh, you're one of the people that's selected to do it, it'll happen. It's like real. You can end up in these strange places easily. All right. We also had this other job I talked about yesterday. And uh, we're taking this one to Greenland. And Greenland is uh, cold as hell, too. But uh, from here, it seems a lot colder, I bet. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is the thing that's wind-powered and solar-powered and it carries a ground penetrating radar across Greenland. All right, and then, uh, now, uh, any, let me just stop there. Oh, oh, one last thing I had to do is always, uh, I've been to the North Pole four times, the South Pole seven. So four times I've carried water from one pole to the other and back. And then I sometimes pour water in. You wonder what's caused all the climate change? That's probably me. I was dumping South Pole into the North Pole, messed everything up. All right, and then, what the last thing is, uh, we set up the satellite links at the South Pole, and so the next one, we have this Guinness records and all, because we did the first. All these things are historic first. So every time we do something, it's super cool. You know, it's like you know, all you have to do is write it up, and you're in some kind of Ripley's Believe It or Not, or or Guinness, or or some museum. It's just like anything. You, all you have to do is write it up because it's so cool. Because nobody does it, and nobody's ever done it since. We've been to the North Pole four times. Nobody's ever been there before or since doing anything like this. All right. And then we have a museum thing exhibit. All right. So let me ask if there's any questions out there. Any, any questions? I, I cut it off. With, there's another 75 more I could talk about, but I'm not going to do it here. Yeah. Do you uh, still using the Yagis arrays? for communication with RAM and radio activity out there? Okay, uh, now, no, now it's finally, that satellite finally died after 38 years, and it finally died. And what happens is, um, in the old days, the satellites were a lot simpler. And like Vanguard 1, the first satellite, the, one of the first two satellites we launched, it's going to be up there for a thousand years. And it's, it's, it's some of these satellites, uh, the transmitter is always on, and so like a light bulb, it lasts forever. It's only when you turn it off and on that it dies, right? So the transmitter's on all the time. It's spinning like this, so it's stabilized. And uh, we had to shut the damn thing off. We're, we're done with you. Goodbye. And it was like we had to shut these satellites off after, after 38 years. The sucker's still working. And there's other things up there that we want to use instead. So VHF technology is pretty much um, gone from NASA now. Okay? But we do uh, S-band, KU-band. KA band, a lot of high, high, very high frequency, uh, 30 some gigahertz. What about the uh, moon bounce? Yeah, in two meters. Uh, I tried it once. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we are the first group in Northeast Brazil to do it. Uh, last year we, do, we, we built a Yagi and uh, try it. No, 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 no. Uh, last year, we tried in the university to, try to, to make moon bounce during a contest. 
and we we you are successful on that. We are the first one group in Northeast to do that. It was it and uh, yeah, it, it was exciting when you saw in this computer screen the signal coming back. Yeah, yeah, it was it was very exciting and um, it was amazing to see this kind of activity uh, on uh, in Asia. Uh, and I never thought that. I know in the ESS have this kind of things, uh, but I never practical activity uh, about it. You know, most people don't do it this way. This is, is very unusual because uh, I get away with a lot of stuff because I've been there for 42 years and uh, like an icon or something, and I get away with all this stuff. But anybody else, they would have to go through the procedures. They would have to write proposals. They have to, next year we'll get around to studying your proposal. Oh, why can't we delay this three years? All kinds of crap. I just, man, I do four years. Oh, well, oh. they're thinking about it. I've already done it, and I don't even ask. I just, boom, we're gone, you know? And Somehow I get away with it, you know, and uh, you, you can't you can't do that all the time. But um, in my robotics program, there's a lot of um, failing and fixing, and young people can really learn. So in the name of uh, learning and internships, I uh, get a lot get away with a lot more stuff. It's like you have an internship with hands-on opportunities to build things. You build things that scientists are going to use, but they're not so expensive that you have to study it forever. Like, for example, a balloon payload, you know, it's a $2 million payload instead of a $200 million. And so $2 million, and then this part you're building is, is like 100K, and so we play with it until we get it working right, we pass it on to the next group, we finally get it working right, and then they use it. And, and, and doing it that way, uh, you get more done, and you get more experience, and everybody says, oh, this is great, because we're help, helping young people, see? So in the name of helping young people, I'm getting away with even more stuff, you know? And so I just try to turn it into an adventure because I like, I like cool stuff just like you do. I never got over the thrill of doing something that can't be done. So I, like, I love that can't be done stuff. And okay. so uh, that's our next thing. Uh, let me tell them something in Portuguese. Okay. okay. Só tem um cara na NASA que eu conheci que poderia ter feito o que... Eu eu, nós fizemos ano passado, que foi levar a Janine para fazer um estágio. Eu estava aqui na campus ano passado, ela perguntou como é que eu faço para trabalhar na NASA, eu não tinha nem ideia. Eu conheci esse cara e ele conseguiu passar em cima de toda a burocracia da NASA para levar a Janine para lá. É, é, esse, é esse tipo de, de atitude que ele tem. Okay? E agora uh, a gente está procurando pessoas que estão interessadas em... em em desafios que estão interessados em romper co e fazer coisas difíceis tá? então se vocês estiverem interessados em fazer o estágio na NASA enfrentar muita dificuldade né Janine <risos> muita mesmo para conseguir fazer pode vir conversar com a gente pega o meu cartão para entrar em contato, você tem o e-mail do Mike também, pode entrar em contato direto com o Mike não tem regra não gente eu recebi um punhado de e-mail hoje perguntando quais são as regras. Tem regra não. A regra é vontade de fazer, entrar em contato e não desistir nunca. Essa é a regra. Ok? Agora eu vou pedir uma salva de palmas para o Mike. E quem tiver interessado, vim conversar com ele, fica à vontade, tá? Obrigado. E quem tiver interessado no decal que tem alguns aqui, ó.